Republic Day, India. The world's biggest democracy celebrates its independence. India has been under foreign domination for much of the last thousand years. It was only 50 years ago that India emerged as a sovereign nation after 200 years of British rule. For centuries, Indians had longed for freedom and one family made that dream come true. They flourished within the empire, but broke with it to lead the quest for independence. The whole family endured years of jail and suffering until Jawaharlal Nehru and his descendants came to rule independent India for almost 40 of its first 50 years. They forged the destiny of their country, but they paid a terrible price. Partition, civil strife, and a violence which consumed them. For three generations, they were able to win power through the ballot, and twice, bullets and bombs tore it away. This is a story of ties of blood, and sacrifice, and power. One family has shaped the destiny of India, a huge subcontinent and one-fifth of humanity, its own elective dynasty, the Nehru Gandhis. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. From this confluence of two holy rivers of India, the waves of dynasty were to cover the whole country. Here in Allahabad, 500 miles east of Delhi, lived the man who would become India's first prime minister. Here too was born his daughter, herself to follow him as leader of the nation. The house itself, named Anand Bhavan, or House of Joy, became the epicenter of Indian nationalism. In the early 1900s, it was the house of a wealthy lawyer named Motilal Nehru. Motilal came from a family of Kashmiri Pandits, Indians of the highest caste, and advisors and courtiers to India's rulers for generations. It used to be said that wherever he sat became the head of the table because he was such a tremendous personality and my mother always remarked on his huge roar of laughter that would sort of set the rhythm of the household. Motilal Nehru himself was highly westernized uh, and you must remember in those days modernization, westernization, anglicization, they were all equivalent terms because the only window we had to the outside world was through England. England for us was the world. And it was to England that Motilal Nehru sent his only son for his education. In 1905, Jawaharlal, aged 16, enrolled at Harrow. Churchill's old school training ground for the British Empire and its army was an unlikely nursery for a future freedom fighter. But in those days at Harrow, and later at Cambridge University and the Inns of Court, Jawaharlal was as much a socialite as socialist.
His letters home plead his own poverty from gambling debts and tailor's bills rather than the poverty of his fellow man. And when his father needed to dress up for a special occasion, he cabled Jawaharlal. I have received the command of His Gracious Majesty George V to be in attendance at Delhi, a funny way of inviting a gentleman. For Motilal, nothing but the best. Jawaharlal hurried to the king's own tailors. I replied, I got your cable the day before yesterday and have ordered the court dress and the other clothes you required at pools. I suppose you want the ordinary levy dress with sword and everything complete? Thus, properly attired, Motilal was ready for the occasion. Together with other important members of the Indian elite, he attended the 1911 visit of the new king, George V, and Queen Mary on their visit to India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Motilal was an eminent trial lawyer at the Allahabad High Court. He was highly respected and earned a fortune. His son was well placed to do even better. And in 1912, Jawaharlal returned to India, a qualified lawyer and thoroughly westernized like his father. I don't think anybody quite realized that Jawaharlal, by the time he came back from England, would be uh, an Englishman in his values, in his behavior, in his uh, manner of living, and the way he liked things done. I think every one of them, at some time or the other, thought that, that Nehru had uh, more than was necessary of uh, the West in him. However westernized, the Nehrus were still Indians at heart, and Motilal insisted on an Indian-style arranged marriage for his son. The chosen bride was Kamala, very pretty, but alas, not as highly educated. Kamala was only 16, and Nehru 26, when the wedding took place in Delhi. Within a year of the wedding, Kamala dutifully produced a baby, a daughter called Indira. Motilal was overjoyed with his first grandchild. But his growing family was now coming under a new influence, that of a lawyer of a very different kind from the westernized Nehru's. His name was Mohandas K. Gandhi, a leader of India's budding freedom movement. His spinning wheel became a symbol for self-sufficiency. Homespun products were to replace imports from Britain, so weakening the imperial link. Gandhi was the inspiration for oppressed people everywhere and a guiding star for the Nehru's. He was able to galvanize the country, make it conscious that freedom was its birthright. He felt the pulse of the country much more than Nehru did. Nehru, after all, a product of Harrow and Cambridge universities, a bit of a brown sahib, uh, going holidays, skiing and that kind of thing. And he arrived on the scene. And I think he also sensed that if he had any future in politics, it had to be uh, uh, with Gandhi. He had to ride his wagon and, and he could achieve his goal. Nonviolent resistance to British rule was the form of struggle initiated by Gandhi on April 6, 1919, to fight the British Empire. For the weak Indians, it was a most powerful weapon. It provided the Indian freedom fighters with the moral strength to challenge British brute power. Mm -hmm. 
One week after the first demonstration, General Reginald Dyer decided to teach those Indians who espoused nonviolent resistance a lesson they would not forget. On Sunday, April 13th, Brigadier General Dyer marched with his armed force through the tortuous, torrid streets and mazy lanes of Amritsar. He ordered the troops to fire upon the seething mass of humanity gathered for a peaceful meeting. The Amritsar massacre was to become legendary in the story of Indian nationalism. Hundreds of defenseless Indians died, unable to flee from the British bullets. For Jawaharlal, it was a watershed. He became a fervent follower of Gandhi. The urge to go out and strike a blow for India, do something in a new way, in this non-violent way, uh, appealed terrifically to my brother, as it must have done to a lot of other young men. And suddenly, life in Anand Bhavan and all that it had meant became meaningless, and in fact, terribly superficial. Both Jawaharlal and his father had played a key role in the Indian National Congress, a polite body of the anglicized Indian elite, which had no real aspirations to independence. But now, Gandhi's non-violence and Amritsar's rifles were to convert father and son into Indian freedom fighters and re-clothe the Nehrus, both literally and metaphorically. They changed dramatically. They started to dress in Indian style and stopped eating Western food and even speaking English at home. All the beautiful clothes that they all had, made by Henry Poole, with the king's uh, tailors in London, <laughs> were all burnt and replaced by uh, village-made, hand-spun, hand-woven, thick, uncomfortable <laughs> khadar. I remember him only from the time when he had joined Gandhiji, and I never saw him in Western clothes. He was always in a dhoti and kurta, and I remember him, that shawl that was always uh, over one shoulder, making him look like a, a Roman senator in a toga. Gandhi urged his followers to embrace poverty, but Jawaharlal knew nothing of this India. As part of his education, Jawaharlal set out to see what the rest of India was like outside the privileged walls of his home. He knew the facts, that India's 250 million was an uneasy mix of the fabulously wealthy and desperately poor, of many faiths and even more languages. But unlike Gandhi, he did not know the reality. What he saw would make him not only a nationalist, but also a socialist. I was filled with shame and sorrow. Shame at my own easygoing and comfortable life. Sorrow at the degradation and overwhelming poverty of India. Their faith in us, casual visitors from the distant city, embarrassed me and filled me with a new responsibility that frightened me. He wanted to declass himself. I mean, he could, not, he could not change the diction of his English, but he could change the quality of his lifestyle, and he did it. He lived with them, he ate with them, he, uh, and that is how he won their affection. In 1921, the Prince of Wales, the future king, toured the empire to raise morale. With him came the man who would one day end British rule in India, Lord Mountbatten. It was on this trip that the young Mountbatten proposed to Edwina, who would herself, in years to come,
develop an intense relationship with Jawaharlal Nehru. The Indian Maharajas, who with British approval ruled half of India, welcomed the prince and his party. But the masses of the people, following Gandhi's lead, resorted to the hartal, or total boycott. When they arrived, the crowds were very thin and very disappointing and, and quite hostile. And in fact, several engagements, I think, uh, really were cancelled. I remember that there was a complete hartal, a complete strike in Allahabad. The streets were vacant, there was no traffic, all the shops were closed, uh, and the Prince of Wales procession <laughs> went along with nobody to see it. Many protesters were arrested, including both Motilal and Jawaharlal. They were now in the leadership of the freedom movement and deliberately invited imprisonment by the British authorities. Motilal tried to find out what life in jail would, all be, would be all about. And he was horrified to learn that uh, not only would his son actually have to sleep on the floor, but actually wash his own underclothes. And uh, in his own mind, Motilal had started preparing himself for the rigors of jail by practicing sleeping on the floor uh, in his own home. Yet he was not prepared for six months of it. For Motilal, it was a tremendous culture shock. I mean, the last thing that the best lawyer in the country wants to know is that he's going to go to jail. But, uh, of course, uh, being Motilal, once he had made up his mind, he sort of uh, did it with a vengeance. Motilal and Jawaharlal were soon visited by the 12-year-old B.K. Nehru. The first thing I heard when we were near them was the laughter of Motilal, a very, very loud and very peculiar uh, laugh, recognizable by anybody because it came right from the belly. And <laughs> I heard him, his laughter. So I realized that he really couldn't have been tortured or or ill-treated, he must be all right. A few years later, in 1929, the Indian National Congress met in Lahore with Motilal, now a national hero, at its head. Gandhi put his immense prestige behind the election of Jawaharlal Nehru as the new Congress president for that year. It was a defining moment for the freedom movement and for the man. Now for the first time, Nehru called for total independence for India and for an open revolt against British rule. What struck me and people like me, the younger generation, more than anything else was his statement. We are out in an open conspiracy against British rule. This was a frank statement. It was a conspiracy, but an open conspiracy, open struggle. It meant leadership of a new generation coming into its own against the older generation. Jawaharlal Nehru represented the youth of the country. Four weeks after the Lahore Congress, on January 26, 1930, Gandhi called for a nationwide pledge to join Nehru's open conspiracy. My, my mother had told me that this very moment Everybody in India would be saying the same thing. That, that gave us a tremendous sense of, um, what shall I say, unity, satisfaction, glory, uh, greatness. We felt that we are really doing something very, very important. I shall never forget the 26th January 1930. Few expected to see it, but complete independence was now the declared goal, and millions joined the struggle. That year, Gandhi led his salt march, challenging the British right to tax salt. Following Gandhi's lead, Indians everywhere made salt without paying tax, demonstrably breaking one more British law. Hundreds and thousands of people were there, and uh, fires were lit, and um, we went in, took seawater in the earthen vessels, and brought the vessels and put them on fire. And after 
sometime the water evaporated and something black substance, some black substance, that was salt. So we, picked, we had broken the law. The British responded with determination, zealously confronting each and every protest, however non-violent. Thousands were imprisoned. Jawaharlal himself spent most of the early 1930s in jail. The frequent arrests were memorable to Nehru's young niece. Departures for jail were always an occasion of excitement. It was not going to jail, what a terrible thing. You were brought up to feel that going to jail was something wonderful, that we were doing it for a, a goal, a, a very special reason, and that you had to go with a glad heart. And in fact, they did go with glad hearts, the ones in our family that we, as children, that we saw going off to jail, uncle, father, mother, grandmother, <laughs> everybody. Jawaharlal was to spend nearly 10 of his best years under British lock and key. Comforts were few, but as a privileged political prisoner, he had access to pen and paper. Lengthy volumes and endless letters poured forth such as this to his daughter Indira on her 13th birthday. A time comes when, for a great cause, even simple, ordinary men and women become heroes. Great leaders have something in them which inspires a whole people and makes them do great deeds. Jawaharlal was writing of Gandhi, but Indira must surely have seen her own father in his words. The highlight of those days were interview days, which came once a fortnight, 20 minutes. And I found my father always cheerful. I don't know how he was feeling inside, but the interview days meant so much to him that he made a special effort to tell us amusing things that had happened. But the frequent imprisonments took their toll on the 70-year-old Motilal. In February 1931, he fell fatally ill. The British allowed Jawaharlal out of prison to attend the deathbed. There he sat like an old lion mortally wounded, with his physical strength almost gone. Suddenly I noticed that his face grew calm and the sense of struggle vanished from it. I thought he had fallen asleep, but that sleep was his last and from it there was no awakening. Jawaharlal was broken because uh, even though he might have tried to break away from him and uh, he was very dependent on him. The new head of the Nehru dynasty was dealt another blow when his wife Kamala was struck down by tuberculosis but it did not curb her determination. I think he grew fondest of his wife when she joined him on the streets in the early 30s in, in that movement. And he, he discovered a great love for her because he knew that she was doing it for him. In 1936, the ailing Kamala died. In the following years, Nehru and his daughter Indira would grow closer, and increasingly, the caring company of other women became important to Jawaharlal. Very, very important. And I think that is true of many of the freedom fighters. Because after all, when you take the youth of a person, put him into jail, when he does come out, he starts seeing the world anew. He was himself an extraordinarily handsome person, very intelligent, a caring person in his own way when he wanted to be caring. And uh, he had many women friends. 
Jawaharlal's reputation as a left-wing leader was growing both at home and abroad. In 1938, Nehru traveled to Europe, visiting fellow socialists, the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War, and the Czech leaders at the time of the Munich crisis. He visited Germany and observed Europe marching inexorably toward war. In his own mind, Nehru put himself squarely on the side of the anti-fascists. But his primary concern was the fate of India. When war did break out in 1939, India felt far away from trouble. The British Viceroy ordered full-blown ceremonial grandeur for his daughter's wedding in New Delhi. But within two years, war was approaching India's border. To the complacency of the colonial British, there came an abrupt and shocking end in December 1941. The conquering hordes of Japan, sweeping triumphantly through the Far East, shattered among the people of India and the Orient the pattern of European supremacy. Out of the smashing and humiliating defeats Japan inflicted upon those who had so long been masters, came a new conception of Asia for Asiatics and an illusory promise of a future from which Europeans would be excluded. The British wanted Indian support in the war. Nehru was willing to help fight the fascists, but Gandhi did not want to help the British. Gandhi said that we would happily support the British, but we would only do it as a free country, not as a subservient country. Jawaharlal, it is not known, actually tried very hard to persuade Gandhi to support the British war effort. Nehru would bow to Gandhi's will and publicly urged non-cooperation in the war effort. His speeches secured him his eighth jail sentence and raised anxieties with the Allies. The United States entered the war with Pearl Harbor December 1941. And in early 1942, they were very concerned about uh, mobilizing the alliance uh, and trying to get more out of India, more arms production, more defense production, uh, and mobilizing the country, which was seen as a potential great resource uh, for the Allies. Very suddenly, India became the key area uh, for the conduct of operations in China, since the Japanese had cut off the coastal approaches to China. And we had uh, very quickly, from the beginning of 1942, a quarter million American military personnel in India. And today, other young men from Georgia and Oregon, Vermont and California, are journeying across 12,000 miles of perilous seas. For the war which has encompassed the earth has made faraway India a vital frontier. It was an extraordinary impact. And uh, ordinary Americans in large numbers, for the very first time, got some sense of what India was, where it was, who the Indians were. In 1942, Sir Stafford Cripps arrived in India. His near impossible brief from Winston Churchill was to keep India loyal during the war without promising much about independence once the war was over. The clock of destiny is ticking away and war and danger hover over the world. We shall have to face their consequences also and we can only face them by forgetting our petty troubles and conflicts and pulling all together. The United States' help in the negotiations was insufficient to bridge the gap. There uh, was a U.S. desire for India to be independent, but not at the price of rupturing the alliance. Winning the war, maintaining the alliance with Britain was ultimately more important for the United States than 
pressing the British beyond the breaking point for Indian independence. Gandhi considered the British offers inadequate. He called the Crips mission a post-dated check on a failing bank and escalated the freedom struggle by launching the Quit India movement even as the war continued. Demonstrations against the British engulfed India. Gandhi then came to the view that Indian people are getting demoralized. So he wanted to initiate a struggle. Nehru, on the other hand, uh, was not in favor. But in the end, he agreed with Gandhi and enthusiastically agreed with Gandhi for Quit India because of this other argument that uh, not to struggle means to demoralize the Indian people, that we are helpless and we can't do anything. The British immediately arrested Gandhi. And in Allahabad, they arrested Nehru and several members of his family, including his niece. I was just 18 years old then. And earlier in the year, when I had my 18th birthday party, that was supposed to be my coming of age. But actually, my coming of age was 30th of August when I was taken to jail. <laughs> Even as the struggle for independence in India continued, there was euphoria over victory in Europe. Yes, V.E. Day was here at last. Costumes and decorations mingled with the uniforms of those who'd fought in the battle for freedom in one giant kaleidoscope of color. The Indian troops, mostly Muslim, who did fight with the British, marched too. Another great cheer greeted the forces of India, whose magnificent fighting record is now saluted by Britain and her people. The men for whom this triumphal march was a fulfillment of all their hard-won victories. The Indian soldiers who fought for freedom and democracy all over the world were yet to get freedom and democracy at home. But the war did herald the end game for British India. A month after the ceasefire, the British government called a conference in Simla, the summer capital of India to start the discussions for an end to British rule. Nehru and Gandhi were inevitably out of touch. It had been Nehru's longest prison term of all, and Gandhi had been released only because he was seriously ill. My talk with Nehru at that time was in Simla, and uh, I, it was the first time I had seen him since uh, early in the war because he'd been in prison. He had very recently been released. My sense was that uh, since being released, he really hadn't caught up with the realities of the situation. Uh, I, I thought two things had happened during the war. One, that uh, the cost of the war on Britain had greatly weakened Britain's capacity uh, to return to its pre-war status. And two, that during the war and even before, uh, the Muslim movement, the Muslim League movement, had become much less an elitist small group and much more a mass group. The Muslim League had joined the British in the war effort. Its leader was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Now he expected his reward, a separate state called Pakistan in the Muslim majority areas of India. This meant a whole new reality. It was now Jinnah, once an anglicized lawyer like Nehru, who was to be Nehru's principal adversary in negotiating for independence. It made the discussion slow and laborious. With little to report on the inconclusive conference, the young journalist Kushwant Singh left Simla by the last rail car of the day. As we were coming down the hill, the radio was on, and the British elections results were announced, and the Labour Party had won the election. Now, there were only two Indians in that rail car, and as soon as they said the Labour Party had won a landslide victory, we both got up and yelled and almost embraced each other, because we realised 
that this, the Labour Party in power in England, would mean the, that independence to India was round the corner. The newly elected government recognized that Britain would have to grant freedom to India. Lord Mountbatten, the supreme allied commander Southeast Asia, would oversee the handover. As luck would have it, he had already met his counterpart in Malaya. Under Jawaharlal Nehru flew to Singapore, the first stop in his lightning tour of Malaya. He was received by Major General Kimmins on behalf of Admiral Mountbatten. Panditji had come out to see the Indian community in Malaya. And in those days was a, considered a very dubious figure as this um, freedom fighter. The British authorities had decreed that he should be given no recognition and no help whatsoever. And my father said, this is absolute nonsense. Uh, we have to deal now with a post-war situation. This man is going to be the Prime Minister of India one day, and uh, we have to have a good relationship. When he arrived at the airfield at Singapore, he drove straight to Government House, where I had a preliminary talk with him. And then I drove him on in my own open car, as far as the Indian soldiers' canteen where my wife was working. Everybody outside tried to race to the doorway to, to get in. So there was, again, a sea of, of humanity pushing and shoving. And one of the first victims was my mother, who was knocked um, sideways and then under a, actually, I think, crawled under a table, thinking, you know, from wartime practice and avoiding bombs and things, get under the kitchen table used to be the answer. So under a table she went. And so she found that, that we, <laughs> eventually she emerged from the table to find Pandit Nehru helping her to her feet, and that was how they met. It was to prove a fateful meeting the first step in what was to become a grand affair of the heart. We liked him enormously. The atmosphere was very happy. And we couldn't help feeling that in that atmosphere, he probably liked us a bit too. In March 1947, Mountbatten, now the Viceroy, arrived in India with a plan to hand over power in just one year. Nehru had the advantage over other Indian leaders, thanks to his earlier meeting with the Mountbattens in Singapore. Now, Nehru became a frequent guest of the Viceroy's. I remember very early on when we were up in Simla, I was sent into his room with a message. I suppose I must have knocked at his door, which is the kind of thing he would be very impatient with. Come in, come in, come in, you know. So I sort of burst in and, and found the Prime Minister of India standing on his head, because he used to do yoga every morning. And so I, I suppose I looked, you know, oh, come on, don't be silly, what, what do you want to say? So we had a long conversation with him standing on his head. While Nehru was at Simla, the latest British plan offering independence to an Indian federation of Hindu and Muslim states was already in London for cabinet approval. But Nehru had not seen the details. On a sudden hunch, Mountbatten showed him a draft. This is something I couldn't possibly have done except on the basis of a complete mutual trust. Nehru turned the new draft down flat. He said it would lead to the balkanization of India and he would have nothing to do with it, and he doubted it if any party would. It was a great disappointment, of course, a great disappointment. And um, I think that uh, our reaction was, well, he's done his best, but he'll have to try again. Next, Mountbatten offered straight partition rather than federation as the only option. But he still had to get the consent of Jinnah, the Muslim leader, for what the Muslims were already calling a moth-eaten Pakistan. And Jinnah was known above all for using one small word. In dealing with Jinnah, Mountbatten had a problem because Jinnah had reached the position of power that he had got by what I call exercising the veto. It was always a question of, of um, no. I mean, no, no was the, the answer that came most frequently to his lips. Oh, no, said Jinnah, we must have Pakistan. And so it went on. 
a circular argument, round and round the mulberry bush. I never met anybody who could say no so persistently and so effectively. I remember my Batten telling me that the only person he'd not been able to persuade to budge an inch was Mr. Jenner. Finally, on June 3rd, 1947, a breakthrough. Momentous days as the Viceroy holds vital talks with the leaders to discuss the transfer of power to Indian hands. Early on the scene is Mr. Jinnah, leader of the Muslim League. As the thermometer blazes up to 112 degrees outside, water is sprayed upon the door curtain to keep the inner temperature down. Pandit Nehru and other delegates have a short word with Viscount Mountbatten before the talks begin. That day, they reached an agreement. Jinnah consented to the division that would separate India from future Pakistan. Nehru congratulated all participants. We are little men serving great causes, but because the cause is great, something of that greatness falls upon us also. And I have no doubt that we are ushering in a period of greatness for India. The next day, Mountbatten called a press conference and sprung a surprise on both the negotiators and the press. In the course of the hundreds or so questions that were asked, somebody asked, when do you think the transfer of power will take place? And Mountbatten observed that he thought it would be sometime in August. The implications were tremendous. At one word from Mountbatten, India, a fifth of mankind, would be divided into two independent states, not in a year's time, but in just a few weeks. The partition of India was a high price to pay. Gandhi had anointed Nehru as first prime minister of independent India. But the Mahatma would have nothing to do with partition and stayed away from Delhi on Independence Day. Gandhi, to begin with, said over his dead body, and it may not have been over his dead body, but it was certainly over his broken heart. Nobody wanted the division of India. But division it had to be. On the appointed day, August 14th, 1947, Jinnah got his Pakistan. He had only a year to live as its leader. As for Nehru, he was India's undisputed leader, but partition would sour the sweet taste of freedom. The finest uh, aspect of Jawaharlal was the intensity with which he felt the other's pain, particularly the pain of the innocent. He knew that partition would entail a pain of a kind India had never experienced before. Nehru knew what the millions flooding into Delhi to celebrate did not, that violence between Muslim and Hindu was already tarnishing the brilliance of the hour of liberation, set for midnight on August 14th. That night I went to Parliament House. We were there till midnight in a milling crowd. And then at midnight, this hushed silence. Then Nehru's very famous speech, Tryst with Destiny. It, it, it was a very electrifying experience. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. The main emotion of the day was uh, an intense and widespread joy and a belief that at last, after all these centuries and centuries of rule by Muslims and British, uh, India was independent. The thrill of independence that we were at last free was so strong, so powerful, 
uh, that uh, uh, it was indescribable. Freedom had been the star that uh, guided my parents. You know, it was like the Magi uh, going towards uh, the birth of Christ or like Galahad and the Grail. I mean, we saw it in the most romantic terms. The independence of India bade farewell to Nehru's role as heroic freedom fighter. But the sea of problems which was to beset him as prime minister was already engulfing him. Independence brought Nehru to power, but he had no power to control the huge upheavals it triggered. All humanity was on the road. We couldn't imagine so many people. Somebody said, my father has been killed, my mother has been killed, so many. All, all stories were really harrowing kind of thing. India had been divided and exploded into sectarian hatred. Across northern India, people abandoned their homes to escape violence. The new state of Pakistan had been carved out of two areas where Muslims were a majority. Nehru worked with frenetic energy for refugees. Careless of his own safety, he would break up violence himself when he saw Muslims attacked. Nehru rushing with his uh, just small baton and said, get out, get out, get out, this is not done. I mean, the people did uh, tell him, they took care. How can uh, the prime minister do this kind of thing? But I remember him, very human. I remember one night in Amritsar Station at midnight, a train was coming in from Lahore, which is only 30 miles or so away. It had been stopped three times before it crossed the frontier. And uh, whereas I was an observer and not participating, obviously everybody who was there had to help. And we took out uh, I'd, uh, maybe two dozen bodies and nearly 100 uh, people who had been uh, slashed uh, with either swords or agricultural implements or, or whatever. Several trains bringing back Muslims from India and shifting to Pakistan. They were cut up in Patiala and Amritsar, the two six strong strongholds. And just bodies were sent to us with women having baby, suckling babies and laws going right through them. Nowhere was the violence more intense than in Punjab, an area with a large Sikh population among the Hindus and Muslims. It had been cut in two by the new border between India and Pakistan. In fear for their lives, Hindus and Sikhs fled Pakistan as Muslims struggled to reach their new homeland. Massacres on both sides inflamed what became the largest migration in human history. 14 million moved. Countless thousands were killed. Some just died. A train bringing some Muslims came into Pakistan and shouted, Allah Akbar. God is great. And at that very moment, a woman, old woman of 70 or 75, who was carrying herself with great difficulty walking, asked me, Sir, have I 
reached Pakistan? And I said, yes, ma mother, you have. And she sat down, said Kalima, and died on the spot. Pandit Nehru never imagined a situation like this would come about. In fact, I don't think he had planned for this at all. What he thought was, once partition was agreed to, both the countries will settle down in their work. But it was not so. And uh, he was very depressed in those days to see the suffering of the people. While Nehru struggled with the birth pains of the new Indian nation, an old India still survived. More than 500 native Indian princes, whose realms include states varying in size from a few villages to thousands of square miles, today retain their thrones only through treaty agreements with the British. In the hands of a few of these rulers are concentrated some of the world's most enormous private fortunes. The princes had accepted British rule. In exchange, they'd kept their royal status, their wealth, and their private armies. So when the last British viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, negotiated Indian independence, the princes weren't included, and their future remained undecided. These princely states pockmarked the map of the subcontinent. The largest was the size of Texas. Some were a few square miles. Most of the princes joined India, in exchange for a handsome pension from the government. But Kashmir bordered India and Pakistan. Both wanted it, and the conflict plunged Nehru into his second crisis within weeks of independence. The ruler was a Hindu Maharaja, but his subjects were Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, with the Muslims in a majority. Nehru wanted Kashmir to prove that India was a safe home for all religions, including Muslims. Paradoxically, Kashmir's most popular Muslim leader and Nehru's close friend, Sheikh Abdullah, also wanted Kashmir to join India. It was the leader of the Kashmiri Muslims who did not want to go to Pakistan. If Sheikh Abdullah had wanted to go to Pakistan, I mean, the matter would have, you know, would have been closed right then. And that was why the Indian claim had its moral legitimacy rather than just the legal legitimacy. Sheikh Abdullah's support for India was a blow to Pakistan's ambitions. Pakistan's leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, now feared he might lose Kashmir and decided to force the pace of events. He called me. He said, Shokat, what can we do? I said, sir, the only way to stop this thing happening is to walk into Kashmir. He said, I don't want to involve my army. And in any case, my army, the three battalions, are completely involved in carrying Muslims out. So we have got no force to fight with. I said, sir, I will arrange the force. And uh, he said, yes, go ahead. You do that. Several thousand Muslim tribesmen were thus encouraged to invade Kashmir from Pakistan. However, reluctantly, Nehru was forced to act. Nehru talked. He had a large perspective on life. He talked about the United Nations. He talked about America. He talked about Russia. He talked about everything. Until Sadar Patel said, do we want Kashmir or we don't? And he said, of course we want Kashmir. So he said, will you give your orders? And he turned around to me, he said, you have received your orders. Indian troops drove the tribesmen back. But Pakistan held on to a section of Kashmir. The Maharaja joined Nehru at the airport for a victory visit. In the war of words that followed, India and Pakistan accused each other of illegal occupation. Nehru never accepted the UN's proposals for a plebiscite. 
and the dispute has warped the relations between India and Pakistan ever since. Meanwhile, in Delhi, Nehru faced a new upsurge of sectarian violence. He turned to his spiritual and political mentor, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi held no office, but he was revered as the father of India's independence. He announced a fast to the death unless violence ended, and within days, calm had been restored. But Hindu extremists and many refugees from Pakistan believed Gandhi was sympathetic to Muslims and blamed him for partition. Two days after his fast ended, a bomb exploded at one of his prayer meetings. No one was injured, but 10 days later, a Hindu extremist tried again with a gun. The light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere. Our beloved leader, Bapu as we called him, the father of the nation, is no more. And Panditji was really crying. And I could see him in tears, see his agony. He was uh, talking, but still not really there, as if uh, suddenly everything is gone from the life, that kind of thing, uh, that uh, helplessness. We started by going up into the roof of Viceroy's house, and you could see a mile down what was called King's Way in those days, which was the, what the route the procession was going to take. And it was an extraordinary sight. Beer sort of totally disappeared under a sea of people surrounding it. It was essentially really a, a people's funeral, so to speak. Nehru wept and sobbed and decided that his master was gone, his father was gone, his political patron was gone. He would therefore, for the rest of his prime ministership, he would try and follow Gandhi's um, teachings. But Nehru felt greatly lost and very much alone in that period of January 48. Gandhi was irreplaceable, but Nehru was to find a new happiness in an unexpected quarter. Edwina Mountbatten played an active role as the Viceroy's wife and later working with refugees. Both she and Mountbatten admired Nehru, but during their last weeks in India, an unexpected relationship blossomed between the wife of the last viceroy and the first prime minister of India. And Mr. Nehru was rather a lonely man. His wife had died many years before. And my mother was somebody who'd not been able really to communicate or make easy relationships with anybody, even with her own husband. And I think the fact that these two um, had similar uh, lack lacks in their lives, which the other person fulfilled, um, gave them a, a, a very strong relationship to each other. I'm quite sure that it didn't go beyond that. No sooner had Nehru and Edwina realized the strength of their affection than they were separated by the Governor General's departure from India in June 1948. But there was already gossip about their liaison. when this whole story about an affair between them became the talk of the town, as it were. A lady from the Washington Post came out here to see my mother to ask her whether, in her opinion, her brother had had an affair with Lady Mountbatten. And she posed this question with great hesitation, you know, so as not to be indelicate. 
So my mother sort of gave a long sigh and said, I certainly hope so, <laughs> because I think, you know, it was just what he needed at the time, and I, I hope that they had an affair and were very happy together. My father very much uh, respected their friendship and trusted them. I think occasionally when she went out on a tour and was going to be stopping off in India, he would rather prudently say, maybe you shouldn't go to some of Pandit's public uh, things can, and be photographed the whole time. You know, you ought to be a little bit discreet because maybe the papers would, would um, read far too much into that. Edwina traveled widely for the Red Cross and visited India most years. Whenever he could, Nehru stayed with the Mountbatten's when he visited Britain. Between these trips, they wrote to each other, a correspondence that lasted the rest of their lives. When Edwina died during a visit to Singapore in 1960, she had with her a bundle of Nehru's letters. After independence, Nehru moved into the former residence of the British Army Commander-in-Chief. With him went the other woman in his life, his daughter Indira. There she played hostess to foreign visitors like Eleanor Roosevelt and acquired much political polish. But Indira had a husband. Feroz Gandhi, no relation of the Mahatma, had been a newspaper publisher living and working in Lucknow. The first years of the marriage had been happy enough and a son and heir, Rajiv, was born in 1944. But by Sanjay's birth, two years later, Indira was already spending time with her father. Feroz became resentful, and the family grew apart as his wife and his two sons spent most of their time with Nehru, far away from him. Indira felt it was her duty to be at her father's side in Delhi, and Feroz felt spurned by this choice because he was a visitor to the house where his wife lived and where his two children were with her. Uh, he went in and out like a stranger, and they were very bad years, I think, for both of them. This was Nehru's official residence. From here, the state was run, and the policies that would guide the country's economy and foreign relations were formulated. Already 58 at independence, he took on a burden of work that would have overwhelmed many younger men. Three private secretaries had to work in tandem to keep up with their taskmaster. One of them was N.K. Session. He used to come out here about 8 o'clock in my office, and Panditji would have already gone to the study, signed his papers, and gone to breakfast. Even as he lived in comfort, he worked hard at his primary task, to reduce the misery and poverty of India. He meets crowds of people who come in the front lawn. Anybody could come in and give the petitions to him, which he used to do for about half an hour, 45 minutes. Then he used to go to the South Block office. Then he came back at about 7. It goes on except for a break for dinner. And if there is a dinner uh, engagement with foreign guests or others present, then you are delayed. And then it goes on till about 3 a.m. Early morning, he is up again. In spite of his Brahmin upbringing, Nehru was a socialist at heart. 
Many of his economic policies were inspired by those of the Soviet Union. It's quite often forgotten that the Indian independence movement was an economic, more than a political struggle. Famine really was one of his most basic obsessions. Freedom meant nothing to the poor of India if it did not mean food, if it did not mean shelter. Nehru needed aid. In 1949, the road to economic development and socialism led him to the world's richest nation, the bastion of capitalism. Jawaharlal Nehru, Prime Minister of India and the Orient's greatest political and spiritual leader, flies to Washington on one of the most important state visits of recent years. The two countries had different agendas. America wanted India's support in the Cold War. India wanted economic aid with no strings attached. The visit was a greatly heralded visit. It was seen as a very important event. It didn't go well. And I think, in part, it didn't go well because of the clash of personalities. Uh, here you had, as the American president, homespun, uh, middle westerner, Harry Truman, uh, not given to uh, philosophizing. And here you had Pandit Nehru, rather English in his manners, Edwardian in his outlook, perhaps. Uh, and they simply didn't hit it off. His way of looking at the United States was then that they were just a country of upstarts uh, who had a lot of money. They, they had no manners, they had no behavior, they had no knowledge, they had no, uh, no culture. Feeling this way made it hard for Nehru to ask for help. However, desperately, India needed it. Some of us who were aware of conditions in India knew that what he needed was a lot of aid quickly, because India was in real trouble both with respect to food and uh, uh, other shortages. Uh, he was, of course, exceedingly reluctant to ask specifically. And he took the line, which was that the Americans should know our needs because they have people there. The great democracy of the United States of America will, I feel sure, understand and appreciate our approach to life's problems because it could not have any other aim or a different ideal. Truman would eventually secure $150 million for India. But Nehru's sympathies remained with the left. However great the aid, no great friendship resulted. He did make a comment toward the end of the visit, saying, ah, the United States is a great country, no doubt, but no one should ever have to visit it for the first time. Back in India, Nehru drove home his political strength and moral authority as he prepared the country and the Congress party for India's first general election. It was to be the largest free democratic election the world had ever seen. 17,000 candidates competed for 489 seats. In the process, Nehru left his mark on both party and country. He pressed ahead with his ambition to modernize India and give it an industrial base. Nehru himself headed the National Planning Committee, modeled after the Soviet Central Planning Office. The committee set targets for rapid development, inadvertently creating a huge and oppressive governmental bureaucracy. When I was first there in the 1950s, I had a good American liberal commitment to what the Indians were trying to do, of that old notion of a planned development. I gradually came to the view that the economic planning involved too many permissions, too much control, and uh, uh, also created an unfortunate industry on the part of the Indian civil service, the Indian public servants, in selling permissions. 
The bureaucracy would stifle small enterprises, but large state works took off. Dams would provide irrigation to increase arable land and food production. Modernization, Nehru thought, was the principal way to stop famine. He also wanted to build steel mills and cement factories, but Western investment was slow in coming, fearing state control. He kept inviting Western investment. The Western investment didn't come. It is only when the Russians gave India what it desperately wanted, a steel mill, that the Westerners decided that they'd made a mistake. Nehru wanted to imitate the rapid industrialization Moscow had achieved. With one five-year plan for India underway, and his second already in view, he was keen to study Soviet planning methods. In 1955, Nehru took the chance to strengthen personal as well as economic links with the Soviet leadership. Indira, as always, was by his side. The visit was the most fantastic thing ever happened. We could go to their uh, atomic energy plants. We went to their uh, steel plants. We went to all over the place, entire Soviet Union. We went to Siberia, Tashkent, Samarkand, all these places. And everywhere, we had an excellent tour. The Soviet leaders paid a return visit to India the same year. They were amazed at the rapturous reception they received. It was a colorful demonstration of Nehru's intention to have friendly relations with the Soviet Union, regardless of his standing with the West. Nehru was also a great admirer of the Chinese Revolution and of its leader, Mao Zedong. He hoped that China and India, the most populous countries in the world, could share in the leadership of Asia, providing a counterpoint to both superpowers. Contrary to American wishes, he supported Communist China's acceptance into the UN. It seems to me completely opposed to the very conception of the United Nations, China not being in it, for instance. It's not a question of liking China to Chinese people's government or not. It's a question of recognizing fact and reality. If you don't, well, it's the United Nations that suffers, not China very much. Earlier, when China invaded his northern neighbor, Tibet, Nehru had refrained from criticizing Mao. But his acceptance of China's use of force to challenge borders was to come back to haunt him. But in the meantime, Nehru wanted Mao as a principal partner as he developed the framework for the non-aligned bloc of countries, countries non-aligned with either the US or the Soviet Union. Nehru wanted to create a real third force in a world split by the Cold War. He wanted a regular forum for the so-called non-aligned leaders. In 1955, many delegates gathered in Burma before going on to Bandung in Indonesia. It was at the time of the festival of Holi, and for President Nasser of Egypt, it showed Nehru in a new light. Nehru's nephew was with them. It's an extraordinary thing, because Jawaharlal, the man so elegant and so fastidious in other matters, just liked to be rowdy in, 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 in the Holi festival. And he got fed up with this repetitive and very elegant way of, of uh, sprinkling water on each other. And he said, I want, to, I want to show you how we play Holi in India. Nasser had a huge Arab delegation with him. And Jawaharlal got buckets of water. And then he took the whole bucket and dropped it on Nasser's head. <laughs> Wetted him. And everybody, these prime ministers and presidents started 
being rowdy with each other. Bandung demonstrated Nehru's influence among a new generation of leaders. His vision had created a movement for newly independent countries which wasn't dominated by the old colonial powers or the Cold War. For Nasser of Egypt, Tito of Yugoslavia, and many other leaders from Asia and Africa, the meetings were a symbol of their freedom from the old masters. Non-alignment was the notion that you separated yourself off from the imperial influences of either the Soviet Union or the United States, that both being great powers conveyed the threat of neo-imperialism. And this brought a large group, of, a substantial group of countries in to the uh, Nehru context. Although uh, non-aligned countries were supposed to be in between the two superpowers, but in actual fact, for instance at the UN, it turned out that on most of the issues which came up, uh, the non-aligned countries uh, and the Soviet Union took the same stand. This was not appreciated in the West. In 1956, Nehru's reputation as a non-aligned leader was tarnished. He reacted very differently to simultaneous invasions in Hungary and Egypt. In Egypt, Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Britain and France went to war to recover control. Prime Minister Nehru was trying to soften the attitude of the British and the French by writing to the prime ministers, and then there was no way for him to side with either the British or the French in this matter. So he sided with Nasser. At the UN, Nehru's close friend and India's ambassador, Krishna Menon, gave a fiery rendering of Nehru's opposition. Neither the United Kingdom nor France had the right to use arms against Egypt because they were not attacked. There is nothing in the Charter, nothing in any moral principles of international law and practice which, in, which places upon any country, however great, however mighty, however steeped in the traditions of the domination by force, that today justifies the walking into another country and say, we shall make you keep the law. That is the function of the international community. At the height of the Suez crisis, Soviet tanks took to the streets in Budapest to put down a popular uprising against Soviet dominance in Hungary. India had denounced the Suez invasion, but Nehru was reluctant to criticize Russia. Why, sir, were you so slow in condemning Russian intrusion in Hungary? Well, I think right at the beginning, we stated, and we went on repeating two things. One was that foreign forces should be withdrawn from Hungary, and uh, secondly, that the people of Hungary should decide their future. That we said right along. As regards other matters, we wanted to be two things. First, to be sure of our facts. Secondly, something which we always have in mind is not merely condemn anybody, but try as far as possible to be constructive and, and not uh, merely say something which might satisfy our, um, our minds, but doesn't help. We want to be helpful <coughs> as far as possible in our small way in the solution of problems. Throughout this period, Indira was becoming indispensable to Nehru, and her power within the Congress party grew. In 1959, she was elected the party president. Feroz was now a Congress MP, with a reputation for exposing corruption. He opposed Indira constantly, and tried unsuccessfully to rally government ministers against her. 
the estrangement between husband and wife grew. A veritable sea of trouble is engulfing me. On the domestic front, Feroz has always resented my very existence. But since I've become president, he exudes such hostility that it seems to poison the air. Despite the bitterness between them, Indira was devastated when Feroz died of a heart attack the following year. The grief, or rather the missing him, is a veil surrounding me and covering me from all sides. I feel as if my luck has run out and have no confidence in myself. Indira had lost her husband and her father was aging. She'd made her mark on the party, but Nehru had no plans to bring her into government. There was no obvious heir as leader. For years, Nehru alone had led India, and now the pressure of office was taking its toll. He became prime minister when he was 58. 11, 12 years had passed. And he was still working 14 to 15 hours a day, writing tens of thousands of words each day, addressing meetings, presiding over the government party affairs. So the strain was bound to show. In 1961, Nehru took what was to be his last trip to the US to meet President Kennedy. The White House is the scene of some of the most important talks the president has ever held with a foreign leader, those with Prime Minister Nehru of India. Kennedy expected a fruitful relationship. Uh, he uh, had been interested in India. He was interested in the nationalist movements around uh, the world. Uh, he felt that these were emerging nations with a significant future. I think he didn't uh, perceive that there should be any great difficulty. Kennedy hoped to convert Nehru into an ally of the United States over Vietnam. He even pledged a billion dollars of aid to India, but he couldn't engage Nehru. Nehru had a wonderful capacity in conversation, simply to ignore the question and not respond. And then you would ask the question again, and he would not respond. And uh, Kennedy didn't know quite how to handle it. When they sat down and talked, Kennedy deferred to Nehru. Uh, he said, Mr. Prime Minister, advise me how we should deal with the problem of Vietnam. And Nehru remained silent. And Kennedy came back to this issue again. Uh, and Nehru remained silent. And he came back to it again. And he could never get Nehru to talk about the issue. And Nehru had one of his moody silences. And indeed, uh, it was said that the only time his uh, eyes lit up was when Jackie Kennedy came in the room. Nehru's failure to create a rapport was partially patched up when Jackie Kennedy made a visit to India, organized by Ambassador Galbraith. We had rented a house for her. Nehru didn't think the house was adequate and moved her to the uh, uh, president's, uh, to the prime minister's residence. It was a wonderfully successful uh, visit, both in social terms, I don't minimize that, but also in uh, the relationship between the two countries. Jackie Kennedy's visit was timely. Nehru was soon forced to ask America for help against China as events on India's northern border turned his world upside down. For years, Nehru had hoped for an Indo-Chinese partnership. When in 1962, China invaded India's northern border, Nehru's worldview collapsed. I'm afraid their, their thinking is little beyond me. They say things which are so manifestly wrong. They go on talking of the McMahon line. They go on saying that we are attacking them on their territory. Everything that they occupy becomes their territory. Nehru had been encouraged by Krishna Menon, now his defense minister, to think that the Chinese would never launch a serious attack. It was just impossible to get him to disagree with Krishna Menon. 
So that when Krishna went and told him that there was no danger and that the army was quite prepared to handle the Chinese, he, he took it for granted. But the Indian border forces were no match for the Chinese, and Nehru, so disdainful of the U.S. in the past, was now forced to run begging for America's help. It was a day of panic. And in that moment, uh, when it looked like the sky was falling in, uh, Nehru sent off two letters to Kennedy. Uh, one of the letters asked for a number of squadrons of American fighter aircraft to come in and attack the Chinese, bomb the Chinese positions in, in Tibet. And the second letter asked for American bombers uh, to come in uh, with American pilots. In effect, he asked for American military intervention. But the intervention became unnecessary. The Chinese suddenly declared a ceasefire and simply abandoned the thousands of square miles they had captured. Mao had proved China's superiority and destroyed Nehru's vision of India and China as the twin pillars of Asia. He's completely shattered. And after that, he was a different Pandit Nehru, totally different Pandit Nehru. He had no interest in life. Anything before him, he did not take much interest at all, just carrying on. And I don't think he recovered from it, really. It was sad, sad, sad. And so it became clear to us that he was uh, uh, not really functioning. And it was sad to see him after having initially seen this vibrant 50-year-old who really carried the nationalist movement of, of India pretty much on his shoulders along with Gandhi. So the contrast was, was great. On May 27, 1964, in Delhi, Nehru held a cabinet meeting. Later, he dictated as usual to his secretaries before retiring. On that day, I got a call from Mrs. Gandhi. Papu is very seriously ill. You better come here immediately and get hold of Colonel Rao, doctors, and things like that. So I rushed here. Then they found out that he had a rupture of an artery. They decided to operate upon him, later gave it up and said that no, it won't do any good and allowed to die. He died, I think, in 138 or 138. In his diary, Nehru had copied out a favorite poem by Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Nehru was mourned as a national hero he had led the struggle for independence and created the foundation for the modern Indian state in 17 unbroken years as prime minister. Already a widow, Indira had now lost her father and her power base. Even as she led the family in mourning, she could not know that her fate and the fate of her children was to be entwined with India's for a quarter of a century. is PBS.
In her bloodline and her name, the widowed Indira Gandhi combined the magic of Nehru and Gandhi. But even so, Indira could not assume she would naturally inherit her father's mantle. My uncle certainly never thought that his daughter would succeed him. I mean, he didn't train her up to be his successor. So that is the key, that whatever Nehru's ambitions for the daughter, he did absolutely nothing to ensure her succession to himself. Indira Gandhi had shown little evidence of her steely determination in her early days. Her beloved grandfather died when she was 13. Her father was continually imprisoned by the British, and her mother, for much of her short life, was scorned by the rest of the Nehru women folk, who all lived together in their Allahabad mansion. Famously, Nehru's sister, Mrs. Pandit, let fall a chance remark overheard by the teenage Indira. It would haunt her all her life. Mrs. Pandit said to her mother, She's ugly. Or She's not even intelligent. And in that household to be marked out as a person of very little beauty and very little intelligence was devastating. Loneliness, being only child, and awareness that she lacked both the vision and the depth of reading and reflection that father had in him, I think had given her a sense of insecurity also. Like her father before her, Indira was sent off to school and university in England, but she did not shine. I, in fact, I was very, very shy. And I had a disastrous experience in London about that time. I was told I had to speak. And I was so terrified, I just couldn't get anything out at all. And um, there was a drunk in the audience, at least I hope he was a drunk. And uh, he said, she doesn't speak, she squeaks. <laughs> naturally, the entire audience dissolved in laughter. After independence in 1947, and throughout Nehru's long rule, Indira had been his hostess and confidant, both at home and abroad. It had been a unique training, but it did not mean Indira would automatically succeed her father as prime minister on his death. And indeed, the new Prime Minister was not Mrs. Gandhi, but the diminutive Lal Bahadur Shastri. He had been Nehru's trusted aide and chosen successor. Shastri paid his debts, and Indira became a minister in his government, but not foreign minister, the job she felt she deserved. Shastri told his press secretary his reasons. He said, she wants to be the Prime Minister. And you, if I make her the Foreign Minister, she already has become powerful. So it's not. So they did not get along well. I think uh, she was biding her time something to happen. Uh, she was not at ease, and he was not at ease with her, because she's ambitious too. And very soon, Fate paid court to Mrs. Gandhi's ambition. On an official visit to the Soviet Union, Shastri died of a heart attack. Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin himself carried the coffin onto the plane back to Delhi, where a new prime minister would be chosen. To attend Shastri's funeral and to select his successor as prime minister, the Congress party bosses, known as the Syndicate, gathered in Delhi. Each was powerful in his own state, 
but none could claim a pan-Indian appeal. Boss of bosses was K. Kamraj. He said, Kuldeep, in this country, the Prime Minister must know either Hindi or English. I do not know either. I don't think I should be the Prime Minister. Kamraj intended to become the power behind the throne, a miscalculation that would eventually cost him dearly. Kamraj, he said, I've got the name, Indira. Probably thinking that he would be behind her to guide her and to... You see, and no one realized that she would suddenly emerge as a very strong-minded woman and a strong-minded prime minister. When it came to the crucial vote in Parliament, Mrs. Gandhi suddenly invoked a legendary symbol. Her father had always worn a red rose in his buttonhole. She put it on, went to the Parliament House with the rose on and people chanting return of the red rose outside and it was done with great effect, there's no doubt. And Everybody loves a winner. And Indira Gandhi had made it. At the age of 48, she was now the prime minister of the world's largest democracy. But the land was harsh, and the new prime minister was beset by its problems. Floods in one state, failed monsoon rains in another. Either way, it came to the same threat, famine. Indira needed help. Mrs. Gandhi has now embarked on a state visit to Washington to promote better relations between the United States, the most powerful democracy, and her India, the most populous. While she came as a supplicant in need of assistance, Indira could play a weak hand sublimely well as a young journalist discovered when he was taken into her confidence. I said, well, what is the purpose? She said, please don't publish it. Well, the purpose is to get maximum possible American aid while all the time making it out that we're not bothered about it, we're not concerned, we don't want it. We want to learn how we can best help you and how our help can be used to the very best effect. We in India are greatly interested and concerned about peace. So to Anxiously, us, Ambassador B.K. Nehru, Indira's cousin, monitored the personal chemistry between Prime Minister and President. But he need not have worried, as Johnson later made clear. He said, you tell her any time she's in trouble, She's not got to let me know. She has, I, I do anything for her. It, it went off really very well. Whatever. Mrs. Gandhi got her food aid and in exchange ordered a massive devaluation of the rupee. Her critics on the left, even from her own party, would accuse her of flirting with the capitalists. She started making moves to pacify the left. Uh, and one of the moves that she made was to start criticizing the United States on Vietnam. And this infuriated Johnson. Uh, and Chester Bowles, who was always uh, defending, out to defend the Indians, the Indian position, sent in a message or told Johnson, well, she hasn't said anything different uh, than the Pope or the UN Secretary General Utant. And Johnson's retort was, well, Utant and the Pope don't need our wheat. So following in her father's non-aligned footsteps, Indira Gandhi now descended on the Soviet premier, Alexei Kosygin. She wanted favors from both the Cold War leaders without being beholden to either. As in America, Indira turned on the charm. She was treated as more than just another politician. 
from however important a country, there was always the feminine aspect to it. Kosygin had shown it in uh, his dealings with Indira. You must understand what she looked like. She looked very vulnerable. She talked very little. Her silences became famous. There would come a meeting with Indira and she would get all that she wanted. The maximum rather than the minimum. She was very good at that. Mrs. Gandhi had neatly endeared herself to the two most powerful men in the world. So she came back, she had been bind and fated, and she was in a great mood. She was lying in bed when I went to see her. And she <laughs> told me all that had happened, and in the end she said, you know, both of them felt that they could advise me and felt that I was a fledgling. I mean, it's the way she said it, as if she had uh, realized even then that you listen to all this, but she was going to do what she thought was right for herself. In India, these foreign conquests seemed far less impressive. Journalists and political opponents wrote scathingly of the capitalist in Washington and the communist in Moscow. Her opponents cruelly dubbed her the dumb doll. There was even talk of a military coup, as it happened in India's neighbor and traditional enemy, Pakistan. But Indira Gandhi had her finger on the pulse of the country, as the army chief, Sam Manekshaw, discovered. Everybody was talking when the army was going to take over, and then by the army they meant me. Manekshaw was summoned to Mrs. Gandhi's office. And she says, everybody says you're going to take over from me. So that shook me for a little while. Not very long, but three seconds. I walked across. Uh, she has a long nose, as you know, I've got a very long nose. I put it next to her, and I said, what do you think, Prime Minister? And she says, you can't. And I said, who? You think I'm so incompetent? I said, I didn't mean that. I meant you wouldn't. And I said, you're quite right, Prime Minister. I came back in the car, thought to myself, she's a very clever girl. She just made a point. The Sam, if you're thinking of doing anything, I know all about it. The army was loyal, but the party was not. In the Congress party's inner sanctum, Mrs. Gandhi now faced a do-or-die power struggle against the syndicate, the old guard like Kamraj, who had put her in power. So she appealed over the heads of the syndicate to the electorate. She said, I stand for progress and they stand for conservatism. I am modern, they are old. I am progressive, they are retrograde. A naked power struggle was clothed beautifully in the attire of an ideological struggle between the progressive socialists and the reactionary retrograde rightists who want status quo and no change, totally heartless for the poor. That worked very well. Having prepared the ground, in November 1969, Mrs. Gandhi daringly called for a split in the Congress party, which had ruled India non-stop since independence. She now formed her own breakaway party, leaving the syndicate bosses out in the cold. And she did it masterfully. And syndicate was nowhere in the picture. We should be very well aware that this is not at all a struggle for power or a clash of personality. Indira revealed a born politician's economy with the truth. It's, uh, it's uh, several things together, I would say. But um, it's basically a difference of outlook. Now, she alone ruled the Congress roost. 
Clustered around her were loyal MPs and supporters who depended upon her for their position and all the favors that went with it. She was really a politician, a politician of modern type who, who knew uh, where to strike, how to strike, when to strike. Methods were not important. The ends were important. Indira's stature was enhanced by the success of her efforts to conquer famine. The wheat revolution brought with it many changes. With increased production, old traditional methods gave way to the new. Today, it is a common sight to see several new implements being used in the fields. Science and technology, mechanization, fertilizers, and high-yield grains created a green revolution, gradually relieving India from the cycles of famine and starvation. And the farmer of today is a very happy person as yesterday's dreams become today's reality. Ministering to India's millions of poor with one hand, Mrs. Gandhi squeezed the rich with the other. She summarily canceled the privileges and pensions granted by her father to the princes and maharajas and nationalized 14 banks. She was now the people's prime minister. Up at 5 a.m. after only two hours sleep, Mrs. Indira Gandhi races through Uttar Pradesh state at a steady gallop. The tireless prime minister with her populist policies had won her people over. Mrs. Gandhi swept home in a snap election called in early 1971. That year was to be her finest. By its end, she would be not just Nehru's daughter, but mother of India. Her unwitting instrument was Pakistan, when the opportunity came to cut India's old enemy down to size. Since its creation in 1947, Pakistan had been two very unequal halves. Now Mrs. Gandhi had a near perfect pretext for intervention, the will of the people of East Pakistan. In national elections, East Pakistan's local hero, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, won every seat on his platform of creating a breakaway independent nation, Bangladesh. The Pakistan government in the West was not pleased, and a no-nonsense military governor was sworn in to impose central control at any price. General Tika Khan was the commander in East Pakistan. Tough soldier. He was known as the butcher of Baluchistan before, and he clamped down in a big way. So refugees started pouring in into India. And in April, it got terribly bad. The West Pakistani forces were perpetrating daily atrocities on the refugees. But India was secretly training anti-Pakistan pro-Bangladesh guerrillas, on the face of it with the best of motives, sympathy for the refugees. The Indians were helping uh, the Bangladesh resistance movement, the Mukti Bahini, uh, launching guerrilla raids against uh, the Pakistani forces, the West Pakistani forces in East Pakistan. Uh, they created trouble, but they weren't able to overthrow them. Uh, and so in the end, the Indians decided that the Indian forces needed to enter. Indira summoned her army chief. An angry prime minister looked at me and said, what are you going to do about it? I said, nothing. It's got nothing to do with me. He said, I want you to do something. I said, what do you want me to do? I want you to march into East Pakistan. I said, oh. That means war. I don't mind if it's war. Mrs. Gandhi could see the gains in her enemy's disarray. With Pakistan vanquished, Indira would be midwife to the nation of Bangladesh and the heroine of India, whatever the difficulties the refugees from Pakistan presented. 
but the refugees kept coming. By the fall of 1971, millions had crossed into India. Indira was impatient. Do you think people are going to sit aside and watch their women raped in front of them? And say that, no, we are going to quieten the situation? That's not quietness. But that you... is the worst possible type of war, is the worst possible type of violence. But how then, without something done to control the guerrilla activity and return for greater discipline by well, the Pakistan take, Army, can I you secure you these first steps? When Hitler was on the rampage, why didn't you say, let's keep quiet and let's have peace in Germany and let the Jews die or let Belgium die, let France die? Would you say that was quiet? By the end of November 1971, the Indian Army had completed preparations to enter Pakistan. Sam Manekshaw was ready to move. It was my intention to go into East Pakistan with all the forces at my command on the 4th of December at 0400 hours. But Yahya Khan beat me to it. On December 3rd, the eve of the Indian attack, Pakistan attempted a preemptive strike and bombed Indian airfields. SS Ray was with Indira that morning. She was absolutely calm, did not refer either to Pakistan or anything of the kind of the attack, nothing whatsoever. She talked of literature, she talked to, she joked, she talked, but she, I could see that she was fully in possession of the situation, nothing unnerved her. She was remarkable that way. The Indian offensive was immediate and massive. I was in constant touch with Mrs. Gandhi. I kept her fully informed of everything that was happening. When things went wrong, I told her they were going wrong. And she smiled at me and said, you can't win every day, Sam. This was not a war in which decisions were taken by the defense minister or the field marshal. These were things in which people put their options before her. And then she would say, do this. During the war, Mrs. Gandhi discovered that the U.S. government had sent the pride of the Seventh Fleet, the USS Enterprise, with its nuclear armament towards the Indian Ocean. America had a dependable Cold War ally in Pakistan and feared for its survival. Mrs. Gandhi had recently signed a treaty with the Soviet Union. An international crisis loomed. A decision came to send the aircraft carrier, the Enterprise, into the Bay of Bengal. It was prompted by uh, concern in the White House that India intended not only to defeat the Pakistanis in East Pakistan, but to take West Pakistan as well and to finish Pakistan off. And, and this particular, uh, this belief was prompted by an intelligence report to the effect that that's what India intended. Publicly, Mrs. Gandhi defied the American pressure. We will not step back by one step. We will not, under any circumstances, step back. And she said it with all the passion and vigor that she was capable of. The nation rallied with her. The daily demonstrations criticized the United States and saluted the Soviet Union. Indians have been demonstrating daily outside the American embassy about the United States' attitude. But the Indian army was very careful not to move against West Pakistan. <laughs> In East Pakistan, there was victory. Dhaka fell to Indian troops, and East Pakistan became Bangladesh.
Mrs. Gandhi announced India's victory and hers to a packed parliament. I've never seen anything like it. She ran into the room like a little child. And she stood up and said, The West Pakistan forces have unconditionally surrendered in Bangladesh. Dhaka is now the free capital of a free country. I was seated behind her in parliament when she announced the fall of Dhaka. She very seldom lost her calm, but on that occasion, she was really, you know, she was, she was euphoric, as it were. Sam Manekshaw shared the laurels with his prime minister. She was an outstanding war leader as a prime minister. Tough as nails. And a friend. Mrs. Gandhi's standing seemed unassailable. She was not just prime minister, people said. She was empress of India. It was a spectacular victory of tactics, political as well as military, and that was the height of her power. The whole country became uh, Indira country as Indira is India, India is Indira. Praise for her wisdom and courage is unanimous and fulsome. The world press does not lag in its appreciation of this modest, patient lady. Commentators, even in the USA, acknowledge her excellence as a leader and a strategist. She is hailed even by her critics and detractors as the invincible goddess Durga. But the decline began astonishingly fast. People soon forgot her glory. National and international crises conspired to deal Indira a series of body blows. Across the country, endless demonstrations protested unemployment and rising prices. Indira's reputation plummeted as fast as it had previously ascended. Mrs. Gandhi, the self-styled embodiment of India, now became the focus of the people's anger. She was accused of sacrificing democracy to nepotism and corruption. People discovered how she with systematically destroyed the instruments the, the, of a democracy. She filled the legislature with her own cronies. She superseded judges who she didn't find loyal to her as she conceived them. She did that to the civil service, to the police. Her decisive test came in 1974, when India's four million railway workers went on strike. They could paralyze the nation, a challenge Mrs. Gandhi could not afford to ignore. But her wholesale deployment of the army to break the strike only served to reinforce suspicions of imminent dictatorship. I was deeply apprehensive about the way that India was going. I had terrible forebodings that a dictatorship was coming, which in fact came. And I couldn't stop writing what I was doing. So she cut off relations with me at that time. And so it was this sort of inability to see the gray, as it were. She was a black and white character. If you were not with her, you were against her. People were beginning to get disillusioned with Mrs. Gandhi, and even people in her own party, because she was no longer acting as a democratic leader, but, well, I, for lack of a word, perhaps like a dictator. Any word of dissent, you were out. In her isolation, Indira turned to her son, Sanjay. Of her two sons, Sanjay had always been the assertive one. Growing up in the environment of political power that was the Nehru household, he was now coming into his own as Indira's trusted advisor. She had great belief in Sanjay's political skills. 
from the early stage and had in her mind that he sh should be her successor. That was there even before he started becoming active. So Sanjay, I think, just took advantage of this kind of climate and his importance grew. I mean, gradually her circle narrowed down to a very few people whom she could trust. Then in June 1975, in Mrs. Gandhi's hometown, the courts struck back. Mrs. Gandhi was found guilty of electoral malpractice. The offense had been minor, but the judgment was momentous. The ruling presented Mrs. Gandhi with a stark choice, to resign and appeal against the judgment, or to stretch the law and declare an emergency. It was democratic duty or dynasty. Ominously, in her darkest hour, it was Sanjay's voice his mother heard. And he said, Mommy, don't be afraid, we'll fight it out and all that. If you resign, it'll be letting down the country. So uh, she did not. Sanjay believed that if she left power even for a day, whoever she put in will become the cuckoo in the nest and will not go thereafter and in fact will resort to any kind of tactics to keep her out of power. From this moment on, Mrs. Gandhi's dependence on Sanjay knew no bounds. He loved her greatly. She felt that he would protect her against everything. The unofficial opposition bound many different strands together. The veteran socialist Jayaprakash Narayan, her father's old friend, was calling for open defiance, a lockout of MPs from parliament, and a mutiny in the army. I watched his huge procession in Delhi marching, uh, and he had become really the virtual opposition to Mrs. Gandhi. The country was seething with daily demonstrations and protests. The press was baying for her blood. The loyalty of the army was never in serious doubt, but neither was Mrs. Gandhi's sense of increasing paranoia. In desperation, she called in her legal advisor. She said, Siddharth, what I told you in the morning has happened. Jai Prakash Narayan has said this. And she gave me the report as to what she had. She had he had actually called upon the army to disobey orders. Now what do we do? Then I said, this is the law, this is the provision. Then you know the rest, that is history. This is NBC Nightly News, Thursday, June 26th, with John Chancellor reporting. Good evening. India, which calls itself the world's largest democracy, is not that today. Under a state of emergency declared by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's government, at least 676 politicians have been arrested including some of the country's best-known opposition leaders. Others claim thousands have been jailed. Censorship has been established. Some civil liberties have been suspended. Mrs. Gandhi took this unprecedented action as demands for her resignation grew based on her conviction for political corruption. India has lost whatever was left of, of liberal support in the United States when it became a dictatorship. And instead of being the world's largest democracy, it was just another third world dictatorship. And former Ambassador Moynihan, in an interview with Playboy magazine, uh, said somewhat crudely, now that India is just like the rest of the third world, all it exports are communicable diseases. Power to all the main newspapers was cut off, censorship imposed. The orders seem to have come not from Mrs. Gandhi, but significantly from her son, Sanjay. It was his idea to shut down the high courts in the country that day and to deny electricity to the in newspapers in New Delhi. Uh, some of Indira's friends protested to her. She went in, talked to Sanjay, came out rather shaken and said, Ki, OK, the high courts will be open tomorrow, but I'm afraid I can't do anything about the, the newspapers. I have not taken any powers whatsoever. 
we are functioning absolutely within the Constitution. All we have done is to detain a number of people. She rationalized it, as she was to tell me later, by saying that the kind of chaos that had been created by the railway strike and the trade unions marching out on the streets and so on left her no alternative and it also created within her the suspicion that all these people who are creating this turbulence have bigger designs in their minds. All my friends fell on me. They said, tell your friend, do does she know what is happening? So I went to see her and I said, why did you do it? And then she said, oh, you know, this and that and the other, and they, they would have destroyed the country. It won't last long. You can take it from me, it won't last long. But in the end, Mrs. Gandhi's sense of insecurity and the influence of Sanjay prevailed. Slogans and catchphrases appeared everywhere, a substitute for political debate. The jails were crammed with perhaps 150,000 political detainees. Others were admonished to keep quiet and to support the policies of Indira and the grand schemes of Sanjay Gandhi. The effect of the emergency, which was to my mind the re-establishment of the rule of law, uh, had not stopped at that, the rule of law having once been established. It had been replaced, already replaced, by the will of Sanjay. Sanjay Gandhi did not need experience to run India. I mean, he loved picking the bureaucracy up, tossing it up and down. He loved telling people that, uh, you know, democracy was not good enough uh, if it came in the way of his plans. There was a certain autocrat in him. He loved power, he loved exercising it. Sanjay Gandhi came like a meteor on the Indian political scene in 1975. He rose to fame in a brief span of five years in a manner that has few parallels in the country's political history. While the country was engaged in the 20-point program of rural uplift, Sanjay Gandhi launched the program of tree plantation adult education with the motto of each one teach one, a crusade against the practice of dowry and education of the masses to adopt smaller family norms. The most controversial aspect of the emergency was the family planning policy. It is estimated that there were seven million sterilizations during the emergency. It was reported that police frequently rounded up men for forced sterilization. There are political groups or orthodox groups who want to resist the program. However, we don't believe in compulsion. We believe in persuasion, and this is what we are trying to do. Some of the stories that are current here and abroad, uh, when investigated, have proved to be uh, false. Uh, this doesn't mean there hasn't been some harassment, because uh, sometimes uh, there are overzealous officials or uh, public workers. I have asked for people in every meeting that if they can produce someone who's been forcibly ster sterilized. And the only answer I get is we've heard about it, but it's not happened here. Do you support the, the pressure that was used wholeheartedly, the withholding of licenses, the withholding of promotion, yeah. uh, in order to get sterilization? Are you behind that? I would support it. Totally? Totally. They obliged by letting Sanjay's power and unaccountability grow until he had uh, literally, you know, usurped all kinds of functions without any corresponding accountability. He has not had any influence on my political decisions. On the contrary, I've never discussed any political situation with him at all, not once. But I, that, that would be inhuman, even as a mother, never mind no, as we a do, prime minister. No, I have kept the uh, children absolutely out of politics, and we never discuss politics at meals, which is the only time when I meet them. But how do you hardly ever then. I, I, I marvel at the fellow. He had a lot of guts. He was a very gutsy man and spoke very little. And he was a man of action. A man of action. Sanjay was all the time on the move. Suddenly, after 18 months of emergency, 
and apparently on no more than a hunch, Mrs. Gandhi announced nationwide elections for early 1977. Her son Sanjay was aghast. He said, in our scheme of things, there were no elections. There were no elections for at least 20 years. I said, but then why you failed? He said, that is because you should ask my mother. I didn't want elections. She'd been determined to go ahead with it, partly because I'm convinced she thought she would win, and partly because it would restore her status as a Democrat and she would wipe out the stigma and stain of the emergency. In the wake of the emergency, the opposition campaigned on ousting the dictator, Mrs. Gandhi. The prime minister herself, out of touch with public opinion because of her own press censorship, traded on the long-standing reputation of Congress and the stability she had enforced. Mrs. Gandhi's party is a one-woman bandwagon but it certainly seems to be rolling here. She makes full use of being Nehru's daughter and plays shamelessly on her name, although she's no relation of Mahatma Gandhi. But neither her name nor the party's oiled machinery were sufficient. Mrs. Gandhi lost by a landslide. Her defeat was so total, she was expected never to return to power. There was dancing in the streets of Delhi as Mrs. Gandhi's Congress party suffered defeat after defeat. Supporters of the opposition People's Party thronged one of their leaders, Mr. Vajpayee. All this jubilation was humiliation for Mrs. Gandhi, who had lost her own seat by 55,000 votes. Her controversial son Sanjay was also rejected by the voters, as well as several senior government ministers. That night, her friend, Pupul Jayakar, went to see her. So I drove over to her house. The first thing I noticed was there was not a single visitor, not a single car. She had been... I went in and found her sitting alone. And when she saw me, she got up, embraced me and said, Pupul, I have lost. You can't answer that, you just keep quiet. The new government attempted to put down its old adversary. Mrs. Gandhi was arrested twice and spent some days in jail, only to be released for lack of evidence. She was already becoming a martyr. Then, in December 1978, she was banned from parliament. When Mrs. Gandhi was expelled from Parliament, I happened to be in the press gallery. It was a memorable scene. And as she was approaching the gate through which, the door through which she was going to exit, she turned around, threw her hand up, and said, I will be back. She was right. At every opportunity, be it local election, public occasion, anywhere, Mrs. Gandhi put herself firmly center stage. And it worked. In January 1980, the first general election since her defeat, Indira Gandhi won back her old seat. But behind all the razzmatazz, almost three years in the wilderness had chastened the power-driven Mrs. Gandhi. She was now 62, unsure, superstitious, and believing one thing only, the survival of the dynasty was paramount. But her dynastic dreams were suddenly shattered when Sanjay crashed his light plane attempting aerobatics over Delhi. He was killed instantly. She came in, sat down in front of me, and said, where do we go from here, Pupul? And she, she, she was holding her stomach. I remember this so well. And it suddenly struck me that it, the wound is in the womb. 
I mean, to lose a child is to fracture the womb. Sanjay was more than her strength and support. He was her chosen heir. At one stroke, Mrs. Gandhi's bright hopes for the dynastic future were consumed. Now, only one course was open to her, to turn to her firstborn son, Rajiv. Mrs. Gandhi was determined not to show her grief at her son Sanjay's funeral. Now the fourth generation of the dynasty was taking center stage as Rajiv performed the funeral rites for his brother. But Sanjay's death left a void in his mother's heart and a gap in Indian politics. Here was a chance for the party to throw up its own leader, as it were. But I think by then, Mrs. Gandhi had so isolated herself to such a degree that she could only rely on her kith and kin, you know, her bloodline. I said, uh, why don't you ask uh, Rajiv to stand by your side, not to join the government, but join the party and uh, she said, I will not uh, influence Rajiv's judgment. He should do what he likes. If you wish to speak to him, you may. Rajiv had no interest in politics and wasn't even a member of his mother's party. He was happy being a pilot. At university in Cambridge, England, he had met Sonia, an Italian student at a language school there. They got married and lived with Mrs. Gandhi, but kept out of the public eye. Politics and he were never made for each other. He was made for a, a professional life. He was made for uh, Sunday afternoons. He was made for Sonia's cooking. He was made for time spent with children. He was made for uh, driving cars at absurdly high speeds. But these were his passions, and this is what he would have happily spent his life at. I spoke to Rajiv and to Sonia. They were both against Rajiv's joining politics. Sonia more than even Rajiv. I told him, I said, your grandfather was alone. Your mother sacrificed her personal and domestic life to stand by his side and hold his hand. You must stand by her side. Ultimately, he agreed, but on the one condition he said, he said, I don't want to join government. I said, your mother also did not join government while she was holding her father's hand. But you can work in the party. While Rajiv told friends he had to help mummy, he knew Sonia did not want him to. Sonia has never given a single interview, but she has written about her feelings. I fought like a tigress for him, for us and our children, for the life we had made together, and above all, for our freedom. Rajiv began to act as a contact point between the Prime Minister's office and the outside world but he showed no sign of acquiring a politician's guile. So far, I've almost entirely been dealing as a sort of liaison to my mother, talking to people whom she can't talk to because of time limitations, from the very poor to some industrialists and things who get, you know, 
some things if there's a stack up then I sort of get some time with my mother or there are all sorts of uh, ins and outs in this. I don't think I really want to get into politics just yet. I'd like to wait maybe one and a half, two years. Then I'll see what it's, whether, you know, it's something I can deal with or handle. But only four months later, Rajiv gave in and said goodbye to his old life. He resigned from his job as a pilot, joined the Congress party, and stood in the election for his brother's old constituency, Ameti. Sonia, too, could no longer resist. Finally, I realized I could no longer bear to watch Rajiv being torn apart. He was my Rajiv. We loved each other. And if he felt he ought to offer his help to his mother, then I would bow to those forces, which were now beyond me to fight, and I would go with him wherever they took him. Predictably, Rajiv won the seat. He was now fully committed as an MP and as a member of the Prime Minister's inner circle. The time had come to prepare him for power. Mrs. Gandhi put Rajiv in charge of a huge building program to provide the facilities for the 1982 Asian Games. The Games were an international showcase for India. Mrs. Gandhi made sure Rajiv didn't fail. Handpicked, very competent officials were attached to him. And the fact that these uh, events went off beautifully and smoothly were advertised as feathers in Rajiv's cap. Increasingly, he became his mother's confidant as Mrs. Gandhi seemed to falter while indecision became the hallmark of her government. In fact, uh, Rajiv and I used to keep pushing her and, uh, you know, on new things which had to be done, and she was very reluctant to do things in a hurry. I mean, she wanted every issue discussed uh, through the cabinet, through the party, take 10 different opinions. And if you do that on every issue in India, it can take you a year. But she was prepared to wait. Mrs. Gandhi presented herself as the mother of all India, but several parts of the country wanted to have more local power, or even break away and become separate states. Sikhs in Punjab waged the most vociferous campaign. They wanted it to be an independent state, Khalistan. In the early 1980s, a young preacher emerged. Sant Bindranwali took literally the teaching that a Sikh holy man is a soldier of the faith. He believed the gun would deliver a Sikh state where negotiations had failed. Opponents of Sikh demands began to be murdered. There was enough information to show that Bindranwale would, would pick up and say, I want the following eliminated in the next few days. And these were being uh, carried out. And the, uh, there was a general feeling that what is government doing about? What are you really doing to, to prevent this kind of, I mean, near anarchy, which was beginning to uh, prevail in the, in the Punjab? So, I mean, there was a lot of pressure on, on the political leadership to act. Mrs. Gandhi suspended the state government of Punjab. Direct rule from Delhi was imposed, and she moved in troops. Bindranwale and his gunmen moved inside the precincts of the Golden Temple. They took up residence in the second most sacred building, the Akal Taht. Bindranwali was preparing for a fight. The Golden Temple now became the focus of the most decisive struggle of Indira Gandhi's life. She knew she could only dislodge Bindranwali by committing sacrilege against the Sikhs' holy places. Mrs. Gandhi seemed paralyzed. She would begin secret talks only to abandon them. Rajiv was a member of his mother's team on Punjab. 
But he couldn't persuade her to act against Bindranwali, and he criticized the government publicly. I think we are not being tough enough in Punjab. We should be much tougher, and uh, we can't allow this sort of thing to go on. On earlier occasions, police has entered Gurdwaras, Police has entered temples, police has entered mosques. Wherever there has been uh, uh, a collection of arms or a hoarding of weapons, they've gone in and cleared them out. Finally, Mrs. Gandhi decided on Operation Blue Star, expelling Bindranwali from the Golden Temple. She called in her army chief. It was a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, she was in a pensive mood. And she realized the gravity of what was going to take place. I put in front of her uh, a set of huge oblique air photographs. This showed the Akaltar from every conceivable angle. And it would be seen that every orifice had been barricaded with gun barrels sticking out to the loopholes. So I told her, well, under these circumstances, I planned to do my best. The chances are that 95% will not only suffer damage, it will suffer grievous damage. Can't be hit. On the 5th of June, 1984, the whole of Punjab was sealed off. Journalists were escorted out of the state. After dark, the army stormed the Golden Temple. But the fight took longer than expected, and over 80 soldiers were killed. By the end of the operation, Bindranwali was dead, along with some six or seven hundred supporters. Parts of the Golden Temple were ankle deep in used cartridge cases when the army finally fought their way in, and the militants had thousands more rounds left. They also had machine guns, bombs, mines, and three tons of gunpowder. Indian television has avoided drawing attention to the bodies of the dead. The dead were cremated by the army, and Sikh soldiers were left to wash the blood from the marble. The army kept control of the Golden Temple while repairs were made before Mrs. Gandhi handed it back to the Sikhs. Perhaps if we had acted earlier, uh, the situation would have been um, less tragic. On the other hand, it was difficult to act earlier until you could prove to them that you had no other option. So... Later, Mrs. Gandhi visited the Golden Temple in an attempt to assuage Sikh anger. But for some Sikhs, nothing she could do would make amends for Operation Blue Star. She knew the danger of Sikh reprisals, but she refused requests to improve her security. And in the Prime Minister's house, she was told so many times to remove Sikh guards, do this and do that. She just wouldn't act. She says, I will not do it. It was to be a fateful decision. One morning, Four months after the storming of the Golden Temple, Mrs. Gandhi walked down the path from her house to give a television interview in the garden. Sonia had just seen the children off to school. I heard what sounded like an unusually close burst of Diwali firecrackers. I called to the children's nanny to see what it was. I heard her screams. I knew at once something terrible had happened. Mrs. Gandhi is assassinated. Her son takes over. Good evening. Indira Gandhi, ruler of the world's largest democracy, died today, shot down by two of her own bodyguards. They were Sikhs taking revenge for the invasion of their temple in June. And tonight, mobs of Hindus have been attacking Sikhs in cities throughout the subcontinent. Indira Gandhi was taken to hospital after she'd been shot by two of her own security guards. Anxious crowds quickly gathered outside the hospital. 
but their prayers were not to be answered. Doctors performed an emergency operation and recovered seven bullets, but the injuries were too severe. We tried to do our best to revive her, and then immediately after reviving a bit, we shifted her to the operation theater on the eighth floor, where a prolonged surgery on her abdomen and chest was conducted. In spite of our best efforts, we could not save her, and she expired at about 2, 2.23 or so. Rajiv was on tour in West Bengal when he heard news of the attack. He was not given much chance to grieve for his mother. I spoke to whoever was available on the phone or otherwise, and everybody was unanimous that Rajiv should take over, you know, as the uh, prime minister. In fact, I hadn't even discussed the matter with Rajiv. I had only informed him when I went to uh, pick him up at the airport. We drove alone, and he said, what's the decision? I said, this is it. Sonia was in tears, and she was really persuading her husband not to accept prime ministership, saying that you should st step back and then allow somebody else to hold this job. And he was telling her that it's my duty, I have to do it, I have to do it. Still reeling from the attack on her mother-in-law, Sonia made her last attempt to save Rajiv from the leadership. I pleaded with him and others around him too. He held my hands, hugged me and tried to soothe my desperation. They were uh, hugging each other and he was kissing her forehead and telling her this. And I could hear all these things because I was standing by his side and tapping his shoulder saying, I want to talk to you urgently. And he suddenly broke loose of her and then said that, uh, come on, let us uh, discuss what you want to. And so Rajiv stepped into the role for which his mother had groomed him. And straight away he said, I agree with you. Let the Congress Parliamentary Board take a decision nominating me and then let the president be informed and let him fix a time. And then I, I told him these are the steps needed. And he said, you go ahead with this. Rajiv was sworn in by the president. Only nine hours after the assassination, the son had succeeded the mother as prime minister. But Rajiv's appointment was not enough to bring calm to the streets of Delhi. He seemed unwilling to take decisive action to maintain order. Sikhs were attacked with great savagery, and their property was looted and destroyed. In the next few days, there was just a carnage that I don't know that the rest of the world has ever properly understood. Uh, Sikhs were butchered on trains coming down from the Punjab, and they were, their, their scalped heads were left hanging out of uh, the doors of cars, coaches on the trains. And there were literally sandals floating in blood in the gutters, and there were terrified people uh, hunched into corners, women and children. Despite the massacre of Sikhs, Rajiv delayed calling out the army to restore order until the morning of his mother's funeral, three days after her death. While a pall of smoke hung over Delhi, Mrs. Gandhi lay in state. My mother-in-law had been the center of our universe, the pivot of our lives. For Rajiv, his mother was all that remained of his family. She had been his teacher, his leader. He could not mourn for her. There was no time to think of his own hurt. I watched Mrs. Gandhi, the funeral procession, and the uh, cremation. And 
the crowds were respectful and silent, but there was no outpouring of grief or anger. The overwhelming feeling was not one of sadness, but one of fear. People were frightened about what would happen to India, whether India would hold together. The reality of the death did not actually hit us. What hit us most was the insecurity of the moment. There was fear rather than grief. In this moment of crisis, the image of Rajiv's calm reassured the nation. Indira Gandhi was dead, but the dynasty was secure. Two days after Mother's funeral, uh, Rajiv met a number of selected editors. And those of us who went there, were quite startled to find that there he was, you see, as if like a crown prince having slid into the throne. There, there's no kind of trace that, you know, he was a reluctant person. Sonia found it harder to adjust. I think she, she still feels that a part of the family life has been taken away or stolen. And I think that does affect her a little bit. And that's also why she's so protective about what she's got left. When Rajiv took office, a general election was already planned. Rajiv's youth and sincerity gave many the hope that he could unite the country and take it forward. What do you think are the issues in the coming election? Issues really are two. One is the integrity and unity of India. And second, progress, taking India into the 21st century. Rajiv led the Congress party to a massive national majority. Mrs. Gandhi's death won the party a sympathy vote, but Rajiv saw it as a personal success. It fueled his ambition. He wanted nothing less than to modernize India. The real quality that uh, drew so many of us to Rajiv was uh, his extraordinary sincerity and his extraordinary desire, it was a kind of, you know, punishing desire to change this country around, make it a modern country. Bring it, bring it to speed with the rest of the world. Rajiv was anxious to promote a fresh image of India abroad. America topped the list. Reagan, in this case, was like a, a bit of an uncle to Rajiv, and so there was a good, a good relationship. Uh, I think when Rajiv Gandhi came into power uh, and suggested that through his policies and through the, uh, the rhythm uh, and his views on modernization, this represented a new look in India, a new opening in India, uh, probably a more pro-Western approach. Uh, this was seen as a very positive thing. You will sense uh, America's admiration for India's strength in overcoming adversities and a heartfelt sympathy for the tragedy that you personally suffered. Rajiv soon found himself pitted against Mrs. Thatcher when he acted as the anti-apartheid spokesman at the Commonwealth Conference in Nassau. The majority called for tough sanctions against South Africa. If Mrs. Thatcher can give us a suggestion, which convinces us that it'll work in a reasonable time frame, we might just consider it. Rajiv Gandhi then came up to see me in the house where I was staying with, with um, a series of sanctions. I said, no, I'm not prepared to agree to those. So I was summoned to a committee of the Commonwealth. And I went down and Rajiv was in the chair. And a very different uh, Rajiv, uh, very tough, and they were starting on at me about discrimination and so on. 
And I said, Mr. Chairman, I'm not prepared to listen to this. If you want sanctions, I'm only prepared to have a, a, a small thing. So I trotted out my little list. Yes, we'll have those. In a consensus, which is what we always have in the Commonwealth, we have come out with a package that will, that is, in fact, the most effective package the Commonwealth could have come out with and has ever come out with. Rajiv made the most of the disappointing package of measures accepted by Mrs. Thatcher. But despite the failure to agree tough sanctions, Rajiv's efforts won him respect among the anti-apartheid leaders. Anybody who stood against Mrs. Thatcher was uh, himself a powerful person. And the fact that Rajiv Gandhi uh, uh, was committed to sanctions, notwithstanding uh, the formidable uh, attack on sanctions by Margaret Thatcher, uh, made him very famous indeed. Not only to us, but to all those who detested the policy of apartheid. After two years as prime minister, what was left of Rajiv's reputation as a reformer was the work of his finance minister, V.P. Singh. Singh was voted man of the year in 1986 for his campaign against corruption. I got uh, full support from Rajiv in the beginning. Then I started uh, getting indications from Rajiv and uh, the Prime Minister's office to slow down or uh, take it a little easier. Singh discovered that a commission was paid to a mysterious agent to buy two German submarines. Rajiv himself had banned such payments, but when Singh demanded that the company reveal the identity of the agent, he was summoned to see an irate Prime Minister. First time I really saw him so angry was red in the face. He said that uh, this company pays so many heads of states and heads of government. Why will it reveal its name? The day it does it, it'll be out of business. I did say that, Rajiv, most respectfully, this is not my part of responsibility, whether this company runs or not. VP Singh resigned and became a vigorous critic of the government. Rajiv's reforming credentials were tarnished, but worse was yet to come. There were allegations that huge commissions had been paid by the Swedish firm Bofors to persuade India to buy a field gun. Rajiv denied there had been any corruption, but the Bofors contract became a national scandal. specific uh, thing of whether Bofors has told us uh, untruths or whether there are payments made to Indians or whether there are connections as is implied in the things. We have asked CBI to go into it mm -hmm. and they will give us a report on uh, all these aspects. I don't want to use the cliche credibility gap but that's what it was really for Rajiv Gandhi uh, certainly in 88 if not earlier there was a huge credibility gap People didn't believe uh, what he said, and the Hindu then began to run in a series the documents related to it. Any time we find somebody is guilty, uh, we will take uh, whatever action is required by law. You stand by that assurance that Absolutely. anybody will take the government? Anybody, high, low, connected, unconnected. Both regarding you and family members, Absolutely. anybody else, both the assurance stand. Absolutely. The documents published in The Hindu kept the Beaufort story on the front pages of the national press and kept Rajiv under intense pressure. The paper's editor knew Rajiv and was called in to see him. I remember him saying, Rajiv, uh, who do you think is behind it? So I, I remember telling him, do you have any doubt that it is someone connected with you, you yourself, or your family? Do you have any, can we have any reasonable doubt about it? And. Uh, he went pale and said, uh, I can assure you that neither I nor Sonia Gandhi 
have taken any money in this deal. And then I remember the next part very clearly, it was significant. But if anyone using our name or influence did it, did it, you are morally obliged to cooperate with me in getting to the bottom of this. But the interesting thing was, never again was I approached by Rajiv Gandhi or the industry. We just did it in public, in print. And I think, without uh, dramatizing it, I saw fear. Ultimately, the only parallel that works with both us is Watergate. The issue was not whether Richard Nixon ordered the burglary. The issue was, did he cover up afterwards? It's the same thing with Bofors. I don't know whether Rajiv took the money. Certainly, there's not a shred of evidence so far to suggest he took the money. But that he covered up, that he prevented the truth from coming out, that, unfortunately, is beyond dispute. With his domestic policy in tatters, Rajiv began another well-meaning initiative, which was soon to put him in personal danger. He engineered a peace agreement between the Sri Lankan government and the Tamil Tigers, a guerrilla group fighting to secure a separate Tamil state in Sri Lanka. India agreed to send a peacekeeping force to guarantee the settlement, a settlement which was so unpopular with many Sri Lankans that it triggered riots. Rajiv went to sign the agreement in person with the Sri Lankan president, but he was warned that he could be a target for Sri Lankans who resented his interference. He said that uh, here we are signing an agreement guaranteeing their safety and security, and uh, you're going to tell them that I'm afraid, therefore I will not take the guard of honor out of the question. I will take the guard of honor. So he walked down this row, and when he arrived in front of the Navy contingent, one of the ratings picked up this heavy 303 rifle by the barrel and swung at the base of his neck. After the attack, Mr. Gandhi's assailant was knocked to the ground by a plainclothes security guard, then hustled away by a naval officer. Sri Lankan President Junius Jayawardena said the sailor was suffering from sunstroke. Walked back and stood with Jayavardhana for the national anthem when everybody was frantically telling him to get away. And I walked up the aircraft and I said, I said, sir, what happened? So he said, the character tried to kill me. <laughs> so I said, what sir, the president says you stumbled. He said, what nonsense is he talking? He took off his bulletproof. Then he showed his left shoulder to me. There were deep blue bruises. Within hours of the signing, troops were arriving in Sri Lanka. The Indian peacekeeping force would eventually rise to 70,000. But very soon it was obvious that all was not well. The Tamil Tigers were selective about the weapons they handed in, and before long the Indian army was fighting the Tigers, and Indian troops were dying in Sri Lanka. In 1989, Rajiv now faced his second general election, his Sri Lankan policy was unpopular, and V.P. Singh accused him of corruption. His first time in the independent, or in the history of India, after independence, that a constitutional authority comes with a report which exposes the Prime Minister so thoroughly that he has been lying to the country for more than two years now. Rajiv campaigned hard, and despite the failures of his government, he expected to win, but he lost. Well, I remember interviewing him in 1988, and he was under strict orders from his media managers not to talk about Bofors. Being Rajiv Gandhi, he then insisted on talking about Bofors, and of course he had no briefing, he had no facts, and he sort of made it up as he went along. And you got a complete mess, that interview was held against him. And I remember asking him at that time whether he thought Bofors was important. And he said, no, it's just a media-created issue. And I interviewed him again in 1990 when he was out of office, and I said, why did you lose? And he said, Bofors. So obviously the realization had sunk in. Rajiv knew that he had goofed, and very often he used the word, yes, I did goof there. Uh, he had goofed, and 
he was trying to correct himself and do things in a way that he would be able to redeem himself. Rajiv was out of power for two years before another general election was called. This time he believed he would win and correct the failures of his first government. I was with him most of the time, but I've never been through a grueling period of that kind. There were days often when we would finish the day's work at six in the morning and at five past six we'd start the next day. And, you know, we'd catch 40 winks, uh, 20 minutes of sleep here, uh, riding in a car, in a plane. It was the most hectic thing and I don't know how he did it. And yet every time he got up to speak, more or less every time, he was as fresh as he needed to be. I was the one that was wilting. Sonia was appalled when she saw Rajiv briefly before he left the southern leg of his campaigning. He had not slept or eaten properly for weeks. He had been campaigning an average of 20 to 22 hours a day. His hands and arms were badly scratched and swollen. His body was bruised and aching. Hundreds and thousands of well-wishers wanted to touch him, shake his hands, to give a brotherly hug or an affectionate thump on his back. It broke my heart to see him in that state. He was not going to be behind bulletproof glass. He was not going to be out there in his western clothes. He was going to be down among the villagers shaking hands and taking flowers. And he, he said to us that night, you know, here in the south, they, they, they want to touch you. Uh, uh, you know, they pinch or they hug or something. They're, it's a different kind of personality. And he was enjoying himself. I think he was enjoying himself immensely. I think he thought he was on a roll. He was on his way back, defensive again about his image, but having a good time, a really good time. On the evening of May 21st, 1991, Rajiv flew to Madras, piloting the plane himself. His press secretary flew with him and arranged for two journalists to travel in Rajiv's car to the last rally of the day. His car screeched to a stop. He got out. Um, uh, my car came up uh, half a minute later, and I went and started talking to the two journalists. And it probably saved our lives. Because as we were standing there talking, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been more than a, a minute or two of extra time. He moved on ahead into the crowd. Rajiv was instantly surrounded by admirers. In the crush was a young Tamil woman, Danu, with bombs strapped to her body. Her accomplice, Hari Babu, took this photograph. It was the last thing he did. And it was just as this conversation was going on, there was this deep um, thump, you know, this explosion. And we looked up and um, it was absolute chaos. There was a sort of uh, dust and some light and people falling around in a circle, like uh, the petals of falling off a flower. And I remember p people's panicked faces all around me as the larger crowd from outside this inner circle began to move in to see what had happened. And, People started to shout, it's a bomb, it's a bomb. So I rushed off to try and look for Rajiv, and I couldn't find him. Um, I found somebody who pointed to him lying on the ground. Um, and that was it. Rajiv's widow, Sonia, and their daughter, Priyanka, returned to Delhi with his remains. Their son, Rahul, was on his way home from America. Sonia had feared politics would kill her husband, as it had his mother. Yet now she found that the Congress party had nominated her as party president. Immediately, she sent her refusal. The tragedy that has befallen my children and myself does not make it possible for me to accept the presidentship of the Congress party. In 1997, there were rumors Sonia would again be nominated. She wasn't, this time. Yet the dynasty still lies in waiting, and Rajiv's widow remains at the center of an unofficial court. 
Their children, Rahul and Priyanka, have not as yet entered politics. Yet all India knows they could still work the family magic if they ever decide to make their mark on the turbulent history of India and its modern dynasty. To order the Dynasty on video cassette or the companion book, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-828-4PBS.